we are live uh hi sorry we are uh, pretty late today um thank you so much for having me i know you all are used to sir so i'll be taking up your classes from today uh i'm actually busy for five days so today and tomorrow we'll be having a class and other five days i am not there um i don't know what sir is planning for you all in that five days but he's going to take up classes or we'll have to wait so let's start today hi i'm dr mithuna uh welcome to you all i heard from sir that sir has actually finished uh, the first 100 slides for you all so we'll start from the para 65 i just want to know whether uh, my voice is clear and, and i'm like is it clear am i audible to you all just let me know if you're comfortable i can't see there's only two online okay clear okay thank you thank you do we wait for some time idhar aur udhar i'm just sharing the link is just sharing the link Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dalia and uh, Kashinath. Let's start. Uh, I think uh, they've shared the links, so people will be joining us soon. So, types of cast. Firstly, we have short arm cast. Cast is extending from below the elbow to the palm crease. Okay, so below the elbow is this is your elbow, below it, and it is going till the palm crease here. I'll show you the pictures. I've included the pictures, and is secured around the thumb. Okay, then you have something called thumb spica or gauntlet. Uh, cast extends from below the elbow again and covers the thumb. it completely covers the thumb okay then you have long arm cast extending from axilla this area is called axilla so it is going from axilla till the palm crease completely so what you are doing is you know allowing the elbow to move so immobilizing the elbow joint and you you immobilize it at right angles at right angles short leg cast are extending below the knee to the base of toe and long leg cast attending from the junction of the thigh so it is coming from the thigh to the base of the toe and then you have something called walking cast what is walking cast is that you have like straps like thing you have velcro where a little movement is allowed also it is also to reinforce the strength and then you have something called body cast body cast is like imagine a mummy okay so completely the body is covered in the cast this is a thumb spica so either the thumb can be free as you can see here in the second picture and this is the thumb which is completely covered okay and then you have the long arm cast as you can see it is extending from the axilla here and it is going up till the palm crease and this is a shoulder spica where the shoulder joint is completely immobilized here okay this takes the uh, the cast extends on the upper body here first here you have uh, i'm not used to this pen first you have here the short leg cast so it is going below the knee here you can see here and it is going till the toes okay this is a cylinder cast it is not uh, extending below the ankle joint and this is a long leg cast as you can see it is coming from the thigh above and going down till the toes this is a hip spica 
so usually you use it for uh, dislocations of uh, the femur in children and this is for the adults as you can see here there it's completely covering uh, it depths the setting the femur in the position there is a there is a socket called acetabulum in which the femur goes and sits so you're trying to put the femur back into its place and putting a cast okay and you're leaving a little bit of space here for the baby to defecate and urinate and the same goes here with the adult it's a little different here okay and then as you have already seen in the previous picture this is the shoulder spica cast i'll show you again yeah this is the shoulder spica cast here in green color so you have a body jacket like cast which covers the shoulder the trunk and the elbow then you have seen the hip spica cast which encircles the body and the leg then you have something called double hip spica cast i'll show you there's a picture again where both the legs and the body are covered with the cast usually pop is used plaster of paris is used here in india because it's quite cheap and the other option is fiberglass this is nothing but they, these are the casts made up of polyurethane resin this is the material used in fiberglass okay it is lighter in weight it is stronger it is water resistant and durable it will set within 30 minutes of application just like pop this is also having an exothermic reaction exothermic is it releases temperature so when it is trying to set or when it is trying to dry you can feel it it becomes very hot you are supposed to tell that to the patient you have to educate the patient about this so that they don't panic plaster cast is not again nothing but pop plaster of paris it's less costly it's heavy it's not water resistant and can take up to 24 to 72 hours to set just because it's also less costly and it's easily available most of the government hospitals they definitely use plaster of paris application of plaster is again just like fiberglass is also an exothermic reaction so you can feel the heat when it is drying up it a freshly applied cast should be exposed to air and supported on a firm surface usually when are we applying suppose you are applying it to a lower limb or an upper limb you have to fix that particular joint suppose you are applying you want to immobilize the elbow joint okay we are doing a long arm cast here so what you do is you're applying the cast from the axilla till the palm of crease and you're putting the elbow joint in 90 degrees position so yaha pe you don't uh, like leave the hand on the surface you have to hold it like that support it so you have you have a help you have to support it if you leave it on a very flat surface what happens is uh, the cast doesn't set properly there's a flattened surface down so whichever surface is there it takes up that shape and that is not good because uh, the space inside the cast reduces and that can lead to various other complications like you can have a circulatory compromise which we don't want you want the blood free flowing you want the nerves to be normal you don't want to compromise those important things okay and then elevation of the applied part is needed to reduce the swelling <laughs> this is the double head spica cast here you can see the body is also included okay and then you are supporting that leg for which the plaster is being applied they are using a pop here again and on the other side also you have a cast now this is a double head spica cast next we are going into coccyx is also called as tailbone it is made up of four vertebra which are fused one uh, into one or two bones so all the four vertebra are fused into this one or two bones called coccyx which is the last part of your vertebral column then you have something called acetabulum i i already told you so you have a pelvis bone i'm i'm sure you have all seen the pelvis bone and you have two socket like things okay in the corner where the femur goes and sits like that so this is an acetabulum which is a concave surface of the pelvis it's a socket of the pelvis in which the head of the femur goes and fits 
same similar thing you have it in the shoulder joint it's called the glenoid okay it's in the glenoid the uh, humerus this bone is called humerus the humeral head goes and sits in the glenoid acetabulum is more concave glenoid is a less concave surface then you have something called acromion it's a bony process on the scapula i'll show you the picture okay uh, scapula is nothing but your shoulder blade that triangular bone which you feel it behind which you can see whenever you put your hand behind is the scapula so you have an acromion it's a bony process of the scapula then you have something called kneecap i'm very sure most of you might be knowing what patella is it's a kneecap and a lot of uh, elderly people do this patella exercises so i'm very sure you know how this looks like it's a small bone right in the knee which is above both your major bones it's just it sits here okay and it keeps moving up and down next then you have something called collarbone okay collarbone is also called as clavicle and uh, there is something uh, i think you've already learned what are types of joints and one of the examples of pivot joint pivot joint is nothing but you have two long cylindrical bones and they move one above the other like this okay that's called a pivot movement or a pivot joint and for this example is your radio ulnar joint so this is your arm uh, this is your forearm okay medially you have your ulna and radially you have it if you can see here below your thumb the bone which you have is radius and below your little finger the bone which you have is ulna so this ulna the proximal part this distal part and the proximal part both move so this movement pronation and supination this is done because of the pivot joint which is at the proximal radio ulnar joint and distal radio ulnar joint and then you have something called median atlanto axial joint Atl atlanto means atlas which is nothing but the first vertebra in your whole vertebral column which is the first cervical vertebra it's called atlas and then the second cervical vertebra is called axis and both of them medially have this pivot joint next you have something called hinge joint hinge joint i'm very sure you know what hinge is like you have it at your doors okay hinges just remember that so there is a uh, Im imagine your uh, for example elbow joint okay you have a hinge movement you have a flexion and you have an extension okay this is called hinge joint this is one of the examples the other example is knee joint and the other example is ankle joint then you have something called ball and socket joint you already understand you have a socket and you have a ball so we have already spoken about this one is your shoulder joint and second thing is your hip joint next example of gliding joint is your wrist joint this is this this joint is your gliding joint the wrist joint so uh, here you can see the ball and socket joint we were speaking about acetabulum right so this this blue line here is acetabulum this this whole thing here is your uh, pelvic bone and this is your acetabulum on which this femur head is going and sitting so this is one of the examples of ball and socket joint this is the hip joint and then here uh you have the ball here this is the humerus bone okay and it is sitting in the glenoid cavity here okay this is the socket as you can see acetabulum is more concave but here this glenoid area is not that concave okay and this this triangular bone which we were speaking about your shoulder blade is nothing but scapula and here you have your acromion process above next we talk about the vertebral column i've already spoken to you about axis and atlas which is c1 is atlas c2 is axis they have special names for themselves and then uh, we have in total 33 vertebra okay they are divided like this into five parts the first part is cervical vertebra so first seven vertebra are cervical in that the special names i have already told you c1 is atlas c2 is axis and atlanto axial joint is a pivot joint and then below it you have c3 c4 c5 c6 c7 and here you can always feel a prominence that is the spinous processes of your c7 vertebra whatever you can feel here most prominent vertebra is your c7 next below cervical you have thoracic okay 
cervical means neck thoracic means your trunk your upper body and then lumbar where you usually wear the lumbar belt and then you have sacral and then you have coccyx so in thoracic you have 12 vertebra and then below it in lumbar you have five vertebra then below that you have sacral which is five fused vertebra and then in coccyx again you have four fused vertebra so remember that sacral and coccyx vertebras are all fused together sacral has five coccyx has four vertebrae are separated the above vertebrae which are not fused are separated by disc as uh, except the first and the second cervical and the sacrum and the coccyx you know the sacrum and the coccyx they're all like fused vertebras and the first and the second are you know they are having a pivot joint there so there's no disc there from below that you have disc separating two vertebras it acts like a shock absorber between the two vertebras imagine if you're rubbing a stone against a stone that's not a comfortable uh, feeling right so this is uh, the movement and it acting like a shock absorber giving nutrition all this thing is done by the disc now c1 vertebra which supports the skull is also known as atlas we have already spoken about it and c2 which pivots the atlas is also known as axis there are 12 pairs of ribs in the human body attached to the thoracic vertebra so thoracic vertebra is what which is participating in formation of the rib cage so i'll show you the picture directly here it's easier for you we'll talk about this so here you can see this is, this is your thigh like bone in the front which you can see is your sternum so actually the color is good i'm not drawing at all i'm not yeah i'm not used to this because i i don't know how sir does this my god now i appreciate his teaching more than anything <laughs> Holding it over. So this is your zippy sternum. Yahan pe it forms a notch here. You can see this. Uh, you can see this notch here, right? So this notch here is called jugular notch. You don't have to know it. It's just a little, of, little bit of extra information. What you can feel here. Okay. So this is your zippy sternum. This is the first, uh, sorry. This is your manubrium, manubrium sternum, and this is your body of the sternum, and the last part is your zippy sternum. here between manubrium sternum and the body you have a slight prominence which is the angle of the sternum which you can feel over your uh, chest this is your first rib your second rib your third rib your fourth rib your fifth sixth and seventh just remember that the first seven pairs of ribs are true ribs why are they called true ribs because it is coming from the vertebra it is attaching to the vertebra behind the thoracic vertebra the first one two seven and then it is coming and attaching here to the cartilage nearer to the sternum so these are called uh these are all the true ribs the first seven pairs and next you have the all the other ribs of false ribs okay here you can see the false ribs which is 8 9 10 pairs why is it called false because they're not coming and directly attaching to the sternum here they're coming and attaching to the seventh rib okay imagine this this is your hand this is going to go attached like this it's not going to come and attach directly to the sternum but it's going to attach to the rib above okay that is why they call forceps because just because not coming and directly attaching to the sternum and then you have the last two ribs here this is the 11th this is the 11th and this is the 12th rib this is the 12th and this is the 11th these are called floating ribs because the only attachment they have is to the vertebra the last two vertebra of the thoracic but they're not coming and attaching here to the rib cage like in in the front they're not coming and attaching either to the sternum or to the uh, above rib okay 11th and 12th so just remember uh, here that the first seven pairs are called true ribs which are directly attached to the sternum with the coastal cartilage and rib 8 to 12 are all false ribs coastal cartilages are attached with the cartilage of the higher rib okay this instead of coming and attaching to the sternum here they come and attach to the rib higher to it next the last two pairs 11th and 12th are called floating because it's only attached to the vertebra and they do not attach to the sternum uh 
uh, crutch walking you we we see it a lot okay once if you all have done your duties in auto department or neuro department i'm sure you see patients using crutch uh, there are types in it okay there is one called the first one is called four point gait it's a weight bearing gait just remember here two things that uh, the four point gait is a weight bearing gait and the three point gait is a non weight bearing gait this is important so what is weight bearing gait what is that four point gait it is most commonly used when both the legs are in weakened condition so both the legs are weak hence the patient is using a four point gait three point gait is a non weight bearing gait used when the injured legs can bear some weight so four point is where you cannot bear any both are weakened you can't it's a, it's a weight bearing gait and three point is non weight bearing gait because uh here the injured legs can bear some weight okay next the three point swing through and there is three point uh, it's it's a little clearer in the next uh, slides i'll just read this for you we have beautiful pictures i'll show it to you three point swing through gait is used to keep all pressure off from the injured legs and swing both the legs through so imagine a patient is walking what he does is he holds his crutch okay puts it in the front first and then he swings through he swings through like a swing okay both the legs come and stand a little in front of the crutch that is swing through go to is there what is go to is wherever you have the crutch like you're putting the crutch in the front and then you go to you you go till the crutch you don't go beyond it you're not going through it hence it's called go to i'll show you the picture steps while ascending stairs i'll just read this if you remember you remember if you don't you know because i myself got confused as a doctor so it took me three readings to understand what this is like just imagine that uh, uh, just imagine a patient okay and he's holding the crutch and how is going to ascend the stairs what you do is shift the weight to the crutches okay first thing second thing you advance the unaffected leg up to the next step so your first step is you're taking a step above is with your unaffected leg okay then you shift your weight to the unaffected leg okay once you put the unaffected leg up you shift the weight on the unaffected leg and then you advance the crutch along with the affected leg to the unaffected leg so what happens is what you're doing while you're ascending is you're putting your best step forward just remember this best step forward so you're putting your the leg which is unaffected above okay and then you shift the weight on that side where it is not affected and then you lift the crutch with the affected leg and then you ascend so this is how you ascend the stairs while using a crutch this this picture is a little complicated for you all, you all but this is easy as you can see the dots here uh the dots here okay they represent uh, the markings of the crutch and the foot here the blue uh print here represents the footprints okay as you can see this is two point gait so what is happening is you're putting your crutch first and then you're ascend you're, you're putting your leg okay two point gait you're able to bear a little bit of weight here it's it's, it's one of the uh, you could say a little best better prognosis among amongst the other gaits here what you're doing is three point gait you're putting both the crutch in the front and then you are taking that unaffected leg ahead okay same thing here so you can't like uh, as you can see one you can see here uh, one crutch is above front one crutch is in behind one foot is in front one foot is in behind this is a two point gait three point gait is both the crutches are pushed in the forward direction and then the uh, limb is pushed forward here again same thing this is a four point gait four point gait kya hota hai is that you know that both the limbs are weakened so they they can't overall they don't have a good movement 
and they they have a very short stepping gear here you can see first to putting one crutch pehle theek hai ek crutch ko aage rakh rahe you putting it a little ahead and then uh, you putting the other crutch behind and you putting the opposite side leg first and then the next side leg next just remember that this is almost like two point gait but you can see the spacing here and you can see the spacing hills but it's pretty less and uh, here you can see the space is little more this is important what is this swing through and swing to swing through is uh you putting both the crutches in the front you can see both the dots here on the front and then you're swinging through it hence the foot comes above in in front of the crutch okay when you're going through it swing to is you're putting both the crutches on the front and getting both the limbs till the level of the crutch you're not you're not going through it you're getting to it okay this if you understand this much it's enough next uh diagnostic evaluation uh first thing is we'll talk about bone scan bone scan is to find out or to assess the progression of a bone tumor or a degenerative disease so what do you do is you inject a radio isotope via iv route and then you perform the scan which takes 2 to 3 hours hmm? uh after 2 to 3 hours you perform the scan wherever there is an increased uptake of the isotope that is the area where there is some kind of degeneration or a tumor some kind of disease involving the bones and it can be seen in bone diseases such as osteosarcoma osteomyelitis and metastatic bone disease what is arthroscopy scopy means you're using vision direct vision you're using a camera so you're using a fiber fiber optic uh, endoscope here for a direct visualization of a joint This procedure is done under strict aseptic technique along with local or general anesthesia. After the procedure, the joint is covered with a compression dressing to control bleeding. Then the joint is elevated to reduce swelling and then the nurses can apply ice pack to enhance the comfort of the client. Also ice pack reduces inflammation or any kind of swelling around that joint. So this is a bone scan here. So first, uh, you have four groups here. Okay, the first group, the second group, the third group, and the fourth group. The first, the first group is a normal bone scan. Okay, as you can see, there is uh, no uptake here. It's all a normal uptake. You don't have an increased isotope uptake here. And the second is you have metastasis only in the pelvis and lumbar spine. Here you can see you have pelvic met. here you can see you have dark blackening areas here so this is a pelvic med and this is a uh, group 3 where you have widespread metastasis you have a wide spread metastasis here and there especially occupying the almost all the vertebra and then in the pelvis too and this is group 4 where you have distant meds okay you have a med here okay the primary lesion is somewhere it has metastasized to this area okay here you have a distant met so do you don't distant met is something where you don't have lumbar or pelvic spine abnormalities next you know what is an ulcer right ulcer means there is a discontinuity in the skin here in what do you call it as a sprain here you have an injury to the joint ligament and the joint capsule the bone is not affected but there is an injury to the the joint ligament or the joint capsule and that is what which is called sprain the largest synovial joint in the human body is knee what do you mean by synovium synovium means you have a bone above just imagine a knee just imagine your knee okay you have a bone above which is nothing but your femur and then you have a bone below which is your tibia and in between these two bones you have a little bit of space both the bones are covered by the cartilage okay and around it you have a synovial membrane and in this space you have a fluid so just like how you fill oil in your uh, engine or in the vehicle which works like a shock absorber same thing here synovial fluid is protective for the knee 
for example now we are talking only about the knee here so it's protective for the knee it's it gives nutrition and second third thing is it protects the knee okay uh, it doesn't allow the knee to erode and most importantly it acts like a shock absorber here that is what is called a synovial joint and the largest synovial joint in the human body is the knee next the average length of a vertebral column this is butty so male it is 71 it's easy to remember and female it is 61 cm now we've already discussed this before in the vertebral column one sacrum has five fused vertebra and one coccyx has four fused vertebra so this is your synovial joint here okay so this is femur मानो ये तो चेंज है यार पहले कलर हार्ड हुआ चेंज येलो इस इन रेड नो रेड नो टू 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 अंजाम है सो दिस इस फीमर ओके and this is your tibia just let's imagine okay so this is your synovial membrane this this all orange thing where you can see here is your synovial membrane this blue thing here is your cartilage which is covering both heads of the bone and this around this whole synovial membrane is your articular capsule okay so this fluid inside is your synovial fluid so this is how a synovial joint looks like so again vertebra uh, just remember that if the vertebra is going more anterior it's going inside just remember it's going inside like that it's kyphosis and if it is coming out it's protruding out it is called lordosis i'm very sure many of you have appreciated lordosis in a pregnant woman so most of the pregnant women have this lordosis because of the gravid uterus especially in the last trimester you can see more prominent uh, Uh, lumbar spine here this is this is lordosis and this is kyphosis here okay this is kyphosis just re just remember that your your vertebral column is not like straight like a ruler it has its own curves if it is straight we we wouldn't have this kind of movements what is a fracture we have spoken about sprain so sprain is what there is injury to the bone the capsule okay or to the ligaments around the joint what is a fracture a fracture is defined as complete or incomplete damage in continuity of the bone so here bone is getting involved that is called fracture and you have two types here first thing is uh, traumatic okay and the second thing is pathological trauma the name itself says the reason for this traumatic fracture is a trauma it's caused by some type of accident fall or any kind of force what is pathological fracture it's pathological fracture is a bo broken bone caused by a disease pathogen is being responsible here for fracture and trauma is being responsible here for a traumatic fracture it's in the name you don't have to put so much of your brain into it so here the bone is broken because of a disease what are the examples you can think about bone cells you can think about bone tumors you can think about osteoporosis and then what are the type of fractures firstly you have a complete fracture so imagine you're chopping a vegetable okay and you're chopping it and you're separating both the part the above part and the below part so what happens is it's a clean cut okay and two separate parts are formed here that's a complete fracture bone is broken completely into two separate parts what's an incomplete fracture bone is broken okay it is completely broken but it doesn't it doesn't break completely it is broken but it doesn't break completely so if, suppose if you have a com if you have a complete this is a complete fracture okay this separates that separates what is an incomplete fracture just imagine you have a fracture till here you have a fracture but it is not in, it's not complete it's an incomplete fracture it's not going through and through okay 
then you have a comminuted fracture what is a comminuted fracture a uh, bone is broken into several small parts i'll show you the pictures it's broken into several small parts so what is a green stick fracture here i'll show you the picture what happens is one side of the bone surface is broken so imagine if this is a bone okay let me draw up a bit so imagine this side of the bone is broken down what happens is this side will bend so suppose if this is broken down this So you can see there is a fracture here and this side will bend okay this is what you call as a green stick fracture which you can see in children next you have something called a simple fracture what is a simple fracture here the bone is broken under the skin but the, there is no damage to the skin above okay the skin texture and the continuity is maintained only the bone has broken down here nothing is happening to the skin it's a simple fracture what's a compound fracture this is another uh, classification the first classification what we learned was firstly is a complete fracture second is an incomplete fracture and third is the comminuted fracture okay and then you have the green stick fracture again the an another classification here talks about it being simple where the skin is not involved and it being compound where the skin is split open and sometimes these bony fragments can come out of the skin so this is a green stick fracture here as you can see there is a fracture here and there is a bend here okay this is seen in children uh, how do you identify it children as you can see uh, bones are not ossified here i don't know if you know this part you have uh, this looks to be like a arm so these are carpal bones you can see it's not yet formed okay this kind of fractures again here you can see a fracture line okay and then you can see a bend here so this is a green stick fracture you have a fracture one side is fractured and the other side is bending this is a comminuted fracture where you have uh, multiple parts of bone fragments here okay this is a compound fracture where the skin is involved okay the bone is broken down and the skin is slit open and sometimes these broken fragments of the bone can be projected out let's talk about osteoporosis Oste you guys have to let me know whether if i am going if the, is the speed okay or you want me to go more slow or a little more fast Just let me see your comments uh is it possible to zoom the pic can we do that no right unda do that we can't do that sorry dalia yeah thank you kashnath for the extra information that you're giving us okay so let's continue osteoporosis is defined as decreased bone mass and bone density so imagine that if this is your bone okay suppose you're taking an x-ray it is supposed to be a uh, radio lucent not transparent if you're seeing more blackening here in between the bone matrix especially in this area it means that the bone is actually losing its calcium and it's turning into an osteoporotic bone so generally in our indian population where you see osteoporosis mostly it happens in women especially if they have stopped menstruating so you see this in post menopausal women okay leading to fractures because here bone becomes very brittle osteoporosis is the most prevalent bone disease in the world the condition is a result of imbalance between bone resorption and bone formation bone resorption is called osteoclastic activity okay osteoclastic and bone formation is called osteoblastic activity you have various diseases based on this two things two phenomenons happening here osteoclastic is resorption 
the word itself means that the bone is getting mineralized here okay uh, demineralized here the once there is resorption just imagine uh, that uh, you have a patient who is hypocalcemic okay who has less calcium in their blood generally normally what happens is where do you get your most calcium from you have to take it from your dietary source okay if you're not doing that what happens is the bone recognizes this and it goes into resorption so it starts just imagine that it's melting away okay that excess that calcium which melts away comes and gets into the plasma or the blood and raises the calcium levels in the blood this is called resorption whenever you have a resorption you have an increased level of calcium in the blood okay and then what is bone formation here the bone forms it utilizes all that calcium to form the bone if you have any imbalance between these two phenomena uh, if you have too much of bone formation also it's a problem if you have too much of bone resorption also it's a problem so it has to there has to be a balance if there is an issue between if there is an issue between resorption and formation it can lead to weak and brittle bones which can lead to a fracture Okay. Usual onset of age is thirty years. Okay, and it is most prominent, especially in postmenopausal women, mm. and especially it is more appreciated in the vertebral column. Rapid progression is seen in postmenopausal women. So these, these, this is the group which is more vulnerable for osteoporosis. They have to be taking good amount of calcium supplements. Okay, and suppose if you have a thirty-five year old coming to you in your OP. and uh, they have stopped menstruating it's an early menopause it's it's not a normal thing but what what you can do here is whenever there is less estrogen estrogen just remember that it's protective for women it also protects you by keeping the cholesterol in check okay it is also cardio protective doesn't uh, allow we, we are less vulnerable if we have good amount of estrogen for heart attacks uh and then even the moment the estrogen goes down uh the bones go into osteoporotic they undergo osteoporotic changes so if there is a 35 year old woman and it's just what is a menopause menopause is if you don't have bleeding for one year okay with no spotting no bleeding in between complete one year you have no bleeding it's called it means that the woman has attained the menopause and 35 is a very less age what can we do here other than just giving we we might think okay madam anna or madam has told that okay if you have to give calcium you just put them on calcium that's not the thing you have to also uh, check their hormones and put them on a hormone replacement therapy you have to give them estrogen and progesterone combination so that they have the normal cycles the estrogen is restored and we can prevent this osteoporosis because it's too young age to have a menopause in india the average age for a woman to attain menopause is 46 46 47 but in western countries it is 55 50 51 so imagine where is 46 and 51 so if you see uh, the bones of the western women are more stronger so indian women are more vulnerable for osteoporosis what is the cause so first thing we've spoken extensively about menopause and second thing if there is a patient who is who has some kind of an autoimmune issue or who is put on corticosteroids you can't avoid it but prolonged use of these steroids can lead to early changes in the bone leading to osteoporosis okay and then there is deficiency of calcium and vitamin d which which you have to take it as a supplement or a dietary source and then even smoking and alcohol can press precipitate osteoporosis what happens whenever these women or men develop osteoporosis firstly there is tingling and numbness second there can be lower back ache because i told you that vertebra is one of the most vulnerable bones in the body which can undergo osteoporosis so especially the you uh, the women start complaining of lower back ache and there is kyphosis i told you what is kyphosis like forward bending of the spine is kyphosis and what happens is as on as the age progresses uh the whole this is how your body is supposed to be like you're supposed to sit straight and as on as you progress this completely bends off okay that can happen 
treatment is here you giving calcium and calcium so along with vitamin d you give which is increased to 1500 mg per day and then if you have young women who are like below 46 and you also want to keep uh, address their menopausal issue you can put them on hormone replacement therapy which is a combination of estrogen and progesterone along with the calcium supplement and vitamin d supplement and then you have calcitonin and bisphosphonates what these do is they prevent bone resorption they prevent the bone from melting off okay remember calcitonin and bisphosphonates both of this prevent the bone resorption and then what are the key nursing in interventions here you have to teach about the dietary sources of calcium so what what usually what kind of calcium we receive is milk yogurt cheese seafood legumes etc and then you have to encourage the lifestyle modification like putting them on isometric exercises what is isometric exercises is you strengthening the muscles also putting them on regular exercises keeps their body weight in check okay ha- healthy mind healthy body you know it 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 just has a very beautiful uh, you you definitely try to become more better in your life the more productive when you are exercising and when you do all this naturally all the other habits like smoking alcohol kind of go down okay and you have to increase mobility you have to encourage these people to walk so as you can see here uh this is the normal bone matrix okay and this is how the osteoporotic bone matrix looks like here you have good amount of bone here everywhere and here you can see all cavitations here there's more amount of resorption less bone formation leading to osteoporosis and as i was talking according uh, as soon as the age advances you can see the forward bending of the spine okay next what is contact dermatitis contact dermatitis usually there are four types of hypersensitivity reactions i will not go into details just remember that the contact dermatitis is type 4 hypersensitivity where you have a delayed hypersensitivity you know nowadays especially in your jewelry nothing is 100% pure just take gold in mind so they have a nickel wiring inside or a copper wiring inside so uh, most of the women and men are sensitive to nickel and copper so whenever you're wearing that jewelry particularly for a longer time that contact leads to dermatitis and that's a type 4 kind of a hypersensitivity reaction corticosteroids so now if you have some kind of an allergy what do you do you put them on anti allergy pills and then you apply some kind of a steroid ointment or if it's too extensive uh, hypersensitivity you put them on oral corticosteroids but what happens is suppose if you're wearing a ring okay there is no proper improper passage of air firstly you have a contact dermatitis along with that improper passage of air can lead to infections there okay wetness prevails there that can go into a purulent uh, bacterial infection so if you're giving a corticosteroid just be cautious and check whether there is an infection because the moment you give steroids all the redness and all is gone but that kind uh, put a blind cover over the infection you might miss that you have to be careful about it so corticosteroids block the action of the phospholipase it's a little into the biochem and the mechanism of action of how the corticosteroids work they reduce the production of prostaglandin and leukotrienes just remember that prostaglandins and leukotrienes are what which is responsible for this itchiness okay this dermatitis which you're developing and that is being prevented by the corticosteroids uh administration of corticosteroids diminishes the activity of the immune system so you're telling the immune system to take a chill pill you know calm down don't overreact so they can mask some of the usual symptoms of an infection so you have to be careful you have to also rule out an infection there there is something called psychoneuroimmunology which is a very new term it's just been like 40 or 50 years since since this has been introduced what this thing talks about is a relationship between three different systems so you have a psychology okay neuro in the sense uh, even endocrine is included in this and then you have immunology and then you have a neurology part of it it's an interdisciplinary science that seeks to understand reactions among psychology neurology and immune responses what 
this point is trying to explain is uh, let's take an example imagine psoriasis i'm very sure you guys have seen psoriasis cases so you have seen whenever these patients are under stress the problem kind of increases way too much or if you take allergic rhinitis uh, my mom is a patient of allergic rhinitis and for her stress is an allergen how is stress responsible this department explains this this psycho neuroimmunology explains this so stress is leading to exaggeration or increase in that or it is causing an allergic reaction here okay that is what the department is trying to explain how your hormones how the stress how the lifestyle modifications are responsible for varied other diseases happening in our body now cytokines are something which can cause uh, the chemicals in our body which can cause fever by their ability to initiate metabolic changes in the temperature regulating center so temperature regulating center in our body is hypothalamus and these cytokines are what which are responsible for causing fever what are the cardinal sign of inflammation this is very important you have redness okay you have heat heat is nothing but the temperature over that particular area where you have inflammation it's on the higher side then you have pain okay first is you you there is no sequence here it's pain there is increased of increase amount of temperature this heat there there is redness there you can see a visible swelling and you can also see loss of function because of the inflammation you are unable to use that particular joint or what which leads to loss of function because you're in extreme pain so you don't want to have any kind of movements in that area what is a sirolimus sirolimus is a tablet it's an immunosuppressant it's in the name it is suppressing the immunity okay this is being used for renal transplant patients so you're doing a renal transplant in those people you're going to give a sirolimus so that whichever the the donor uh, uh, kidney which is coming and being placed in the recipient's body does not cause an immune response in that recipient's body okay we don't want the graft we don't want the rejection of the organ so that is being prevented by sirolimus it is given in combination with corticosteroids and cyclosporin kaposi sarcoma is a tumor caused by human herpes virus 8 hhv 8 uh you can see like when you once you open up the mouth it's on the pharyngeal surface here okay it is commonly associated with human immunodeficiency virus you can see kaposi sarcoma in hiv patients we recently gave our exam so uh we had at least 15 or i think 15 to 17 questions on hiv so you guys have to be careful you, you need to know what kind of infections i don't know if this is going to be repeated in your exam but you know maybe So remember, if they're talking about Kaposi sarcoma, just remember first thing which comes to your mind is you see this in HIV patients, and this is caused by human herpes virus eight. What are the drugs which we use in antiretroviral therapy? What do you mean by antiretroviral therapy? It's a therapy given for HIV patients. Okay, a retrovirus. It's nothing but HIV virus. You give the drugs. It's called ART, antiretroviral therapy. What are the common terms which you listen in your wards? First thing is zidovudin. Is it over here? And then you have uh, nevirapin, and then you have stavudin. So zidovudin, ZDV, is also known as azidothymidin (AZT). This is what you can see in short form. Nothing but zidovudin. Then you have nevirapin, and you have stavudin. These are the most commonly used antiretroviral therapy. This is how contact dermatitis looks. So this this person has worn a ring. which has some kind of an allergen which is not suited to him it's a delayed hypersensitivity type 4 okay it has leaded to redness drying of the skin here itchiness scaliness it's nothing but a contact dermatitis caused because of a contact with that particular jewelry these are the sirolimus tablets which we are using in a kidney recipient patient in which you have done a kidney transplant next what is pressure ulcer day in and day out all the nurses know what are bed sores what is a pressure sore or what is a pressure ulcer so if you taking care of a patient who has been in the bed for a very long time
the dependent areas wherever you have the bony prominences those can lead those there are those are the areas which you can see these pressure ulcers or bed sores which we commonly call so what happens in a inappropriately applied cast suppose if it's too tight there is improper uh, there's a pressure on the tissue uh, there's a tissue hypoxia because of the circulatory collapse like there is improper circulation going to that particular area so unless there is circulation there won't be any oxygen so the circulation has to be normal for the oxygen uh, to for the tissues to receive good amount of oxygen hence preventing hypoxia but if that doesn't happen if applied the cast too tight that can lead to a pressure ulcer so how does the patient come to you if there is a pressure ulcer inside the cast usually they come with a complaint of pain you're not supposed to have pain after applying cast and if they say they can feel some kind of heat or they have some kind of pain under the cast then you have to think about a pressure ulcer if you don't if you ignore it that can lead into pressure necrosis because you're completely shutting off the oxygen supply to the tissue what is going to happen the tissue is going to die obviously that leads to necrosis pressure necrosis happens when the patient reports hot spot tightness so if there is a tightness under the cast firstly that leads to a pressure sore and that can go into necrosis if we don't take care of it earlier next to assess the area what the physician does is either he'll remove the whole cast or he'll cut a small area in the cast which is called a window to check whether there is if there is really a pressure sore there okay what is disuse syndrome disuse syndrome the name itself says you're not using that part what happens if you're not using one particular part if you keep using it all that muscles those ligaments if the joints are active there is active supply of the good, good good amount of supply of blood to that area the whole uh, limb stays healthy but if you're not using it for long time for example in paralysis patients you're not using it what happens is the muscle in that area undergoes wasting and atrophy so if if you see the normal side and an abnormal side the normal side looks very much normal like you know you won't find any kind of wasting there but if you see the abnormal side where the patient has not been using that particular limb you can see the thinning of that limb okay the whole muscle undergo atrophy and definitely because there is atrophy there is loss of strength now to prevent this what what is a nurse supposed to do nurse must educate the client to tense suppose there is whole cast applied here you cannot use this area okay we are immobilizing the elbow here so what do you do here this is your hand you do you have to contract and release so you are not causing any kind of movement in the joint but you are teasing the muscles okay you are causing some kind of a contraction and relaxation in the muscles so this keeps the muscles intact and it prevents this disuse syndrome So you're not moving the bones here, but you're causing some kind of movement in the muscle without moving the bone. And I also spoke about isometric exercises. What isometric means is uh, you are trying to improve the muscle tone here. You're putting one group or a group of muscles into exercises to prevent this atrophy of the muscles and to prevent disuse syndrome. So this is how a pressure sore or a bed sore or a pressure ulcer looks like. You can see this here, and you can see where it has occurred. So this patient has been lying down for long, as, and you can see it's over the ischial ileal spine. Sorry, it's over the ileal bone here. Okay, you have a pelvic bone here. Even that touches the bed, especially at the bony prominences. This is one area. Second area where in If the patient is lying down, where you can see is at the ischial spines. Okay, these are all the areas. So, what are you supposed to do as a nurse? You have to ambulate the patient. You have to keep shifting their uh, position for some time. They have to be on the left for some time. To, they have to be on the right, and especially the bed. You have to use a bed where which prevents this kind of a pressure. So, you, you mostly use air beds. You use water beds. These. prevent especially if the patient is been lying it's he's paralyzed he's quadriplegic you do all these you know and then other than that you have to keep this area completely dry so you apply some kind you do complete bathing sponging and then you apply powder to prevent any kind of pressure or a friction in between the bed surface and the bone above okay 
so i i'm sure you can't read all this but i'm just put this for an example how does it start so suppose you are seeing a patient on the bed okay as a nurse the moment you notice a redness you have to come and report it to the doctor saying that doctor i can see a redness you, because that's the first stage of a pressure sore formation so your first stage is the redness second stage is you have a blister formation you know what's a blister right whenever you have burns you see this water filled blebs over the skin those are called blisters and second thing this blister breaks there is damage to the skin that's the third stage what is the fourth stage is uh, there is a tissue loss and there can be life threatening infections excuse me this was one of the mcqs in our question paper it may be asked because it also comes for basic nurse training so this first stage is redness second stage is a blister formation second stage is a blister formation third stage is damage to the skin and fourth stage is tissue loss so our question was uh, there is a damage to the skin we had a picture where you couldn't see the bone and you know we we couldn't see any kind of infection there was a damage to the the skin and they asked us what is the stage of this ulcer so stage 3 next again coming back to the crutches you have a temporary crutch what is a temporary crutch is it is used when a ligament of the knee is damaged what is a permanent crutch it is used when the paralysis of the lower extremities so if there is a ligament damage so this is sprain you can use a temporary crutch if you have a permanent damage like a paralysis especially in the lower limbs you can use a permanent crutch one crutch can bear 80% this is an mcq and two can bear 100% of the body weight so remember one crutch you might think and answer 50% don't do that it is 80% and two can bear 100% of the body the body's weight what are the types firstly you have, i'll show you the pictures first type is forearm crutch it contains metal band there is a band okay and there is a hand grip which fits around the forearm and then you have an axillary crutch which we see day in and day out it has a padded surface it goes below your axilla you hold it and then you walk like that which is most commonly used so this is the first type this is a forearm crutch okay here you seeing that you have um, you have a metal band here you have uh you have a place where you can actually hold it okay so this is your forearm crutch okay you have a hand grip and a metal band and second thing you have an axillary crutch the picture is not provided here because all of you know how a axillary crutch looks like you just remember if you see a padded surface a v like thing okay and that's your axillary crutch because that that is what we are all used to seeing next <clears throat> what is a traction traction means a pull okay so this you do it uh, firstly we go into straight and running traction what what do you mean by it um i'll i'll give you an example here what is happening is traction in straight line so the body part for which you have to give a traction what why do you give a traction because you have to align the bone there is a fracture okay or if there is a dislocation you have to align the bone in a particular way okay if if suppose this is a bone there is a this is the whole bone there is a fracture and the bone is moving like this okay so what do you do you pull this part okay you apply some kind of weight here you pulling that part you causing the traction and putting it just in front of the above bone so that this both can join this both pieces of the bone can join okay this is called traction the first example is straight and running traction what is happening is this limb is in continuity or it is lying at rest on the bed this is the bed above this is the bed below and this is the limb above it's not being elevated here it's on the bed this is called straight or running traction and to this end you are applying the traction i'll show you the picture and then <clears throat> there is counter traction traction is being provided by the weight which you're hanging on the extreme part extremities and the other side the remaining part of your body acts like a counter traction you need to have a portion need to have forces in 
two opposite directions right so one is being done by the weight which we are attaching to that limb okay which we are doing for the purpose of traction and the other weight the weight of our body is acting like a counter traction and now we have something called balance suspension traction what is this it supports the affected extremity of the bed so here's the catch if they say if the, it is a straight and running traction remember that the body part is lying at rest on the bed there is no elevation here if they are talking about balanced suspension suspension is what hanging from above or you know you're suspending something so balance suspension traction as the word says the extremity of is off the bed it's not lying on the bed it is it is off the bed and it allows some kind of movement again here in balance suspension traction is uh, you i've just told you that the straight and running traction the counter traction is by our body's weight but in balance suspension traction where the whole limb that particular limb is off the bed here the counter traction is being given by the slings or the splints i'll show you the picture this is one example of the straight traction or running traction this is box extension as you can see here just look at this uh, orange figure here this the it, this uh this limb this lower limb is lying on the bed it's not elevated it's over the bed at rest and at this end you're applying a traction here and the body's weight is acting like a counter traction here okay this is not right this is being elevated this don't look at this just look at this imagine there is a bed below this surface there's another picture which is more clear i'll show you that the whole limb is lying on the bed it's not being elevated here this is a sim this is a uh, running traction okay for that example is box extension yeah here you can see this is the bed here okay this is the bed here and here the limb is completely lying on the bed at rest and you're applying a weight here and this weight is not on the bed it's hanging down freely okay and the body is acting like a counter traction so what the picture here talks about is a box extension traction uh, lower extremity is unilateral box extension traction is aligned in foam boot this is a foam boot this this patient is wearing a foam boot and traction is applied by free hanging weight here okay the catch here is remember if you can see a picture where the limb is on the bed at rest and not elevated it's a running traction this is balance suspension traction you can see all these splints and all these act as counter traction but the traction here is same again there's a weight hanging down like that but here the limb is elevated okay and this this white thing along with this rod like thing which you can see is called thomas splint i'll show you the picture again you'll have to identify if you get this picture based mcq so this is a thomas splint and that the splints all those things act like counter traction here but here this is the traction even though the limb is in straight aligned position but it is elevated from the bed it's not lying at rest like this limb okay that is the catch this is what is called balance suspension traction now we we'll go into sutures so many of you know that you have fontanelles so fontanelles are what which are being formed by the sutures so you have an anterior fontanel here and piche you have a posterior fontanel uh how do you know is whenever there you whenever you hold a newborn child you can see a depression kind of a thing where the whole for if you touch our head you can feel the bone is completely it, it's all closed you can't feel a depression you can't feel a boggy or a soft part here but in children you can feel and that actually closes one fontanel closes at 6 months and you know like that we'll not go into depth of it but that soft part where you find is the fontanel which you can see in the newborn So, what is a coronal suture? Coronal suture is it unites. I'll just show you first picture. Okay. So, this is a frontal bone. This is one side view. Imagine there's another frontal bone on the other side. Okay. This is your parietal bone. This is your occiput, and this is your temporal bone. So, this this suture here is your coronal suture. So, coronal suture. What is it doing? Is it unites. the frontal bone the first 
you have two frontal bones here in the front and you have just behind it you have two parietal bones there is a suture going from imagine it's walk going from ear to ear okay just imagine so this suture here it is trying to join two frontal bones and two parietal bones and that suture which you find in between is called the coronal suture what what is a sagittal suture or sagittal suture sagittal is passing like this okay it this you here you don't have a suture but here you do okay so these are two parietal bones here just in between it you have a sagittal suture in the midline if it is going transversely like this if it is going like this then it is a coronal just like your headband uh, whenever you wear a headband that's your coronal suture okay if it is going like a mahantika just to remember you know it is your sagittal suture what is a lambdoid suture here you can see this is your coronal suture okay and this is your anterior fontanel this is your sagittal suture this is your parietal bone this is your frontal bone this is your occiput you can't see your temporals because they're on the sides okay you have two temporal bones here just above your ears here hmm? this is a metopic suture okay sorry this suture here is your metopic suture normally you don't see this but if you see this is how you will see it in a child you can see it as a ridge you can see a you can see a bulging here na no? you can see some kind of an elevation here this is your metopic suture okay normally you don't see it but if you are seeing it it's not a normal finding okay so this is your coronal suture separating your frontal bones from the parietal bones and in between the two parietal bones you have your sagittal suture and this sagittal suture is going down and here you have your lambdoid suture what what do you mean by lambdoid is this is your lambda sign okay so here in this place you have your uh, posterior fontanel okay so this is a lambdoid suture and here you have a posterior fontanel so what is a lambdoid suture it is being formed between the two parietal bones and the occiput below okay like a triangle okay lambdoid suture unites the parietal bones with the occipital bones i've just told you about it what is squam uh, what is a squamosal suture squamosal suture is what which separates your parietal bone from the temporal bone the red end area here this is the the highlighted area here is your squamosal suture okay it is separating your parietal bone from your temporal bone unites the squamous portion of the temporal bone with the parietal bone what is a metopic suture i've already told you it is present in between the two frontal bones if present which if it is present it's not a normal finding normally it is not there but if it is present it is called a metopic suture next tendons you have two terms called tendon and ligament tendon is what which joins a muscle and a bone okay and uh, what is a ligament ligament joins two bones tendon joins a muscle and a bone so tendons are tough bands of connective tissue found in the joints they connect muscles to the bones ligaments connect bones to each other and are designed to help stabilize the joints and provide a structure for the bones so ligaments are what which are involved into a, to help in stability of a particular joint so ligament is bone to bone and tendon is muscle to bone tendons are connective tissues uh, the tough bands found in the joints they connect muscle to bone i'm repeating again it is important because you might get confused ligaments connect the bones to bone to each other and are designed to help stabilize the joint and provide a structure for the bones yeah so these are the sutures again this area is called your zygoma okay this is a zygomatic bone and this is your frontal bone so the suture in in between the frontal bone and the zygomatic bone is called 
zygomatico frontal suture okay and this is your maxillary bones here so if this zygoma this zygoma here connects with your maxillary bone here and there is a suture here that is called zygomatico maxillary suture and then in between the two maxillas you have a intermaxillary suture here hmm? at your philtrum area metopic again i've told you it joins two frontal bones which is not a normal finding again okay so whenever the cast we we coming back to the cast again so whenever the cast is trying to dry you prevent it from any kind of damage even if you hold it with your fingers dentations might form you don't want to avoid it don't do that allow it to dry completely without any kind of damage never let the wet wet cast i've already told you you never let it to rest on a flat surface because it causes pressure within the cast it's not good it has to be like round like that it has to take up the shape of the limb but it shouldn't be flat if that is the case that can lead to a compromise of the vasculature or the nervous supply to that particular limb leading to pressure sores necrosis and other sequelae of it check and compress compare the pulse on both sides of the body so if there is an issue with the left limb you're putting a cast with the left limb you check the peripheral pulses the pulse has to be good and you compare it with the normal side which is your right limb both have to be equal if it is equal it means there is a good uh, capillary or there is a good blood supply going on the vasculature is not being compromised here secondly what do you do is you perform a blanching so this is your finger whenever you hold it when you are blanching it and you leave it there is a capillary refill right if you're checking whether that refill is happening suppose you're checking you are applying a cast to your lower limb you're checking that kind of refill on the skin or on your toes okay you're seeing that whether the blood supply is good enough or not if there is a pale paling occurring if if there if the refill is very slow it means there is some kind of a vascular compromise happening there or the cast is applied too, too tight and you have to release that pressure because that might lead into more complications next you educate the patient notify the healthcare provider if there is any sign of infection so what uh, so, so once you apply cast okay if there is any kind of infection inside the cast there is pain you can feel there is raise of temperature okay they might develop fever and then there can be foul smell coming from the cast all these are uh, red flags the patient needs to see and come and notify the healthcare provider what is the care once you have applied traction okay traction i've just told you the bucks traction uh what do you do what what are you supposed to check here the pneumonic here is again traction t r a c t i o n so first t is temperature which may be from infection of fractured extremities so you're supposed to check the temperature if it is because of an infection impending infection or is, is it because of fractured extremity then the next is r you're checking the rope of the traction which is hanging freely from the bed okay next you have to check a alignment which should be maintained okay counter traction is needed because if you are applying only traction on the one side there is no counter traction on the other side it's not going to work properly you have to align both the upper broken part and the below broken part for which for this you need a traction for this you need a counter traction so you you need to align you have to check the alignment okay next c is circulation you need to check five p's first is pain then is pallor okay if there is a pink uh usually if you have a good capillary refill the whole area is pink but if it is having a pale bluish kind of thing then 100% the vasculature is being compromised paresthesia is this kind of tingling sensation or you feel weakness in that particular limb is what you call paresthesia and then your pulselessness so you check that peripheral pulse so if the pulse is weak or there is no pulse it means you are actually putting pressure on a major artery that's not good again and next and in the last your paralysis which is a pretty late sequelae things have worsened by then and next what is uh, we have finished trac now we go into t here second t is type and location of the fracture what kind of a fracture it is where is it located depending upon that types of cast change types of uh, traction changes okay and then 
I is increase in fluid intake because once there is fracture, there is blood loss. Okay, there is a fluid loss from the body, so you have to check about the fluid intake. Next O is overhead trapeze use, and N is never touch the weight to the bed. So what the weight which is hanging freely shouldn't touch the bed. It has to be freely hanging. Okay, it shouldn't touch the bed. Neither it should should touch the floor. It is hanging free. in the air it's suspended in the air but it shouldn't be touching the bed neither it should be touching the floor so here you can see here you can see the traction which is hanging freely it's not it's not touching the bed neither it is touching the floor this is an example of a simple skin traction buck traction we have just seen here you can see the limb is lying in parallel or is at It, it is at rest on the bed. Okay, this is a gallows traction. This is done for children. And what you're doing is you're putting both the lower limbs and tying them above. Okay, here even the bums are lifted above the bed. Okay. Here, this is a skin traction kit and bandage institute. You're applying a bandage here, and then you have a traction. Next, as I've told you. Knees are slightly flexed, buttocks are slightly elevated, clear of bed. It's not lying on the bed; it's slightly elevated. Okay, this is also called as Bryant. Uh, another name for it is gallows traction. This is this is what I was talking about. This is the Thomas splint. I am very sure many of you know about this. Uh, uh, what do you call it? This is a selfie light which many of you use. That's how it looks like, you know. so you can see here this thing is uh, your lower limb is put into it and this lies near your pelvis area here you can see it is lying near your pelvic area okay this is the remaining part of the thomas splint and this is used for balance traction where you actually lifting uh, the limb above the bed and applying a splint in a client with traction neurovascular assessment is a priority for the nursing intervention so as a nurse what are you going to check you're going to check whether there is all those five p's you're going to check the circulation you're going to check whether they have sensation in that limb you're going to check the capillary refill okay you're going to check the temperature okay these all are what as a nurse you're supposed to do at the bedside in a client with skin traction okay if you are using a skin traction dorsiflexion so this imagine if this is your feet if you move the feet above it is called dorsiflexion if you put the feet down it is called plantar flexion dorsiflexion is caused by action of peroneal nerve and plantar flexion is caused by tibial nerve so if a peroneal nerve is compromised there is a foot drop because you can't lift the foot up there is no dorsiflexion it leads into foot drop and the exact opposite happens with the plantar flexion of the foot if the tibial nerve is compromised in a client with a uh, skeletal traction what is a skeletal traction skin traction is what you're applying bandages around that limb and you're using that as a traction you're using skin here as a traction okay but what happens in a skeletal traction is um there is a pin called simon pin okay s i e m a w -E n so that pin uh goes through and through to the bone it's drilled into the bone and that is being used for traction that's called a skeletal traction nurses should not remove the weight from the traction unless a life threatening emergency what kind of life threatening emergency you have if you have a circulatory or a neural compromise that's an emergency for which you have to call the doctor normally you're not supposed to remove the traction because once you remove the traction the alignment loses and that's not good we have just seen buck skin traction okay you have seen it's a simple traction the limb is lying on the bed and you're using skin here for traction and it's especially used for treating knee injuries we have seen gallows traction where the baby is uh, knees is slightly flexed and the bum is elevated above the bed okay it's not touching the bed it's elevated above the bed and both the limbs are attached above to a rod above that's called a bryant's traction or a gallows traction which is used in fracture of shaft of femur so you the bone 
your thigh bone is also called as femur so if you have any kind of fracture in the shaft of the femur this traction can be used and you have something called russell traction russell traction is again for a fracture of the femur but it's a trochanteric fracture trochanteric fracture matlab it's more proximal it's nearer to the head of the femur hmm? you have trochanters there in between that if you have a fracture it's called a trochanteric fracture for which you use russell tra uh, traction if you have a fracture in the shaft of the femur you're using a gallows traction so here you can see first one uh the brian traction where the bum is elevated above the bed okay both the limbs the knee is slightly flexed here and both the limbs are attached to a traction this is again freely hanging here okay this this weight is freely hanging here this is buck's extension where the limb is lying on the bed okay this is a simple traction skin is used here and here you can see again the traction applied is hanging freely this is the thomas splint i told you right uh which looks like this this is a thomas splint which you can see here this area with this rod coming out like that this is the thomas splint okay thomas splint here is used for suspended balance suspended traction which is not a simple traction but it is here the limb is actually elevated above the bed okay and you're applying the uh, splint you 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 using this for also applying counter traction hmm? what are the orthopedic uh, surgeries open reduction with internal fixation suppose uh, you have a compound fracture what's a compound fracture you can see all those bony fragments are broken the skin is open and all those bony fragments are projecting out of the skin you can't do a closed reduction here it's already open so you'll go for a open reduction So what you do is you're opening up everything and you're fixing it internally. It's a surgical procedure used to fix bone using surgical plates, screws, nails, and pins. Okay, what is a closed reduction with internal fixation? Here, pe you're not opening up the skin. You're trying to put screws and pins here through uh, from the skin itself. You're not opening up. You're not cutting open the skin here. You're not doing any kind of a manipulation here. okay it is reduced without any open surgery followed by internal fixation you putting screws and uh, nails here but you're not opening up the skin here so this is how uh, a talks about uh, fracture so here a talk a you can see you have a fracture this is humerus bone this is your arm this is your forearm where you can see radius and ulna you have a fracture shaft of humerus here and you're putting a plate and you're fixing it okay with screws this is the plate you can see here and you have places where you can put all these screws and you can fix this okay again another plate and screws you can see very clearly this is a fracture of the fibula which is a bone in your lower limb next joint replacement what the, the name itself says you're replacing the damaged joint you have different types in it what we are going to learn about is total knee replacement tkr i'm very sure people all the nurses who have worked for an orthopedic department you this is very normal name very common name which is being used so total knee replacement or you can also call as total knee arthroplasty what are the indications so because the knee is completely damaged you can't do anything about it you're replacing it completely so you remove a little part of the above bone which is your tibia you you, re you remove the little part of the below bone which is your uh, uh, sorry femur and tibia okay and then you are fixing it with uh, processes you're putting a processes above okay which sits like this you have a plate down okay this is the processes for your above bone which is your femur and this is the plate like thing which is a processes for your below bone which is tibia this is going to sit and look just like a knee joint so what are the indications you have osteoarthritis which is a very common condition then you have rheumatoid arthritis because of rheumatoid uh, the whole joint is damaged you are replacing it or it can be trauma fracture of the surrounding bones what is the best stage it is usually between 50 to 80 years common complication is pain and swelling of the legs 
and then you can have chest pain and sudden breathlessness which is life threatening because this happens whenever whenever you have a long bone fracture the fat can escape into the uh, capillaries and go uh, travel as an embolus finally reaching your pulmonary system causing a blockage there okay so what the moment it reaches a pulmonary system and gets blocked there that person will start having chest pain he'll have dyspnea he'll have breathlessness and you have to suspect the fat embolism there which is very dangerous and it has to be taken care of very immediately what is the nursing management you do here so if you have any kind of swelling and pain uh, post operatively you're putting a compression bandage okay and then as a nurse you'll be applying ice or cold packs over the affected knee arrest edema and bleeding so the here, here in this picture you can see you have a healthy knee here how do you say it's healthy you can see the joint space here right none of the bones are touching each other Rem imagine if one of the bone touches the other bone down and you're walking on in such conditions whenever you have uh, a reduction in the joint space it's called osteoarthritis so what happens is this reduction in the joint space can cause this bone to rub over this bone and whenever a bone rubs over a bone imagining imagine a stone being rubbing being rubbed over another stone that kind of pain the person the person howls in pain it's very painful here you can see the joint space is obliterated and this bone is completely attached here okay so this is an arthritic knee joint for which you're doing a tkr you're replacing it above you can see processes being put into your uh, distal part of the femur and here you can see a plate like processes which is put in your proximal part of tibia and this is how your total knee processes looks like on a radiograph this is again another picture okay this is this is the processes above on in your femoral bone and this is the processes plate like processes this is seen in your tibial bone this is again a radiograph of it by doing this you're preventing the bone rubbing against the bone you're preventing the friction and you're causing easy mobility of the joint patient with external fixator the name itself says it is something you're trying to fix from external okay you're not trying to open it and fix it internally you're fixing it from the external part here it is used to treat complex open fracture with soft tissue damage <coughs> so you have a soft tissue damage here you have an open fracture here but still you're trying to uh, use an external fixator especially it is used in children okay what you do is external fixator it inserts pins into the bones and these pins are attached to an external metal of the apparatus i'll show you the picture to provide proper alignment immediate fracture what are the uh, plus of this procedure the plus are there is an immediate fracture stabilization minimal blood loss because you're not cutting open the whole thing so you're causing less bloody feel there as compared to internal fixation and it also you have an improved wound care because the moment the wound is slight you just you're just piercing that area that area you have to take care <clears throat> you're not cutting opening the whole thing and also increased patient comfort these are all the advantages of an external fixator most common complication associated with the external fixator is wherever you have the pin there it can develop an infection so that's the only most com uh, common complication with an external fixator so if you have an infection around the pin site you have pain around it you've warm all the signs of inflammation you've redness you've swelling because it's an infection it's a, it can cause purulent pus discharge which is indicator of osteoma uh, uh, a pin site infection and because this is all nearer to the bone it can again lead into osteomyelitis which is nothing but infection of the bone traction it uses pulling force to align the injured body part it purpose is to eliminate muscle spasm what all you use traction for firstly is to eliminate the muscle spasm to relieve pressure on the nerve to prevent further deformities and to regain the normal alignment we all know it's for the normal alignment there are also other causes like you you are eliminating the muscle spasm you are relieving any kind of pressure if there is a pressure on the nerve you want to uh, eliminate it you're using traction also to prevent any kind of further deformities you do 
you don't want any kind of mal unions mal union and non union is non union is the both the bones are not getting attached mal union is it's getting attached uh, abnormally that can cause shortening of the limb or lengthening of the, you know shortening can occur and if if imagine if you're trying to walk one is one limb is short one limb is normal how are you able to walk you'll have a deformity right you want to prevent it so for to preventing that you have to align the bone properly for which you need a traction this is an external fixator you can see uh you can see pins here okay which are going into the bone so most common complication of an external fixator is pin set infection and here it is attached to a plate or a rod outside through which you can manipulate okay again another example of an external fixator you have pins going into the bone so only this area can develop manu i'm declining a call the shit what happened broadcast by the coach now जरी on his or her back with the pillow between the knees after hip replacement surgery okay the hip has undergone a replacement and you're supposed to keep a pillow between the two legs patient should always sit on a high chair avoid crossing of the legs avoid hip flexion more than 90 degrees these are all the these are all what you're supposed to educate the patient about when they're getting discharged so first thing is you're supposed to be sleeping on their back second thing you placing a pillow in between two limbs third thing they are supposed to sit on a high chair and fourth thing you are supposed to avoid crossing of the legs and fifth thing is you are avoiding hip flexion flexion is you are putting the hip towards yourself you are not supposed to do it more than 90 degrees so this is how you can see a pillow is being placed between the two limbs okay pillow is being placed between the two limbs these are all right a pillow is being placed a pillow is being placed a pillow is being placed here there is no pillow the person is crossing over his legs and that's not okay fractures again we coming back to fracture you have what are what are the signs how do you know there is a fracture firstly there is pain at the fracture site there is something called crepitus okay you can hear that sound whenever the fracture limb is being moved which we normally don't elicit because you don't want you have to immobilize the fracture side you don't have to move it but if you try, if the patient is trying to walk with that kind of a fractured limb you can hear a crepitus and then you have shortening of the extremity because of the fracture and displacement of the bony parts you can have shortening of the extremity and then you have this five p's of inflammation the first is pain you can have pulselessness if there is any damage to the blood supply and then you have pallor because of improper blood supply you can have paresthesia because the nerve can be involved here tingling can happen and then it can lead into paralysis because of permanent damage to the nerve what are the key nursing in interventions what is a nurse supposed to look for you have to assess for the shock because there can be a significant blood loss whenever there is a fracture if there is an arterial involvement there can be a lot of blood loss so you have to assess for the shock what happens in shock you have hypertension okay the patient will have syncope hmm? syncope is that uh, shock means what completely it's like uh, they're unconscious there is hypotension okay there can also be bradycardia bradycardia is like pulse your pulse is dipping uh you also assess for signs of fat embolism i've already told you whenever the patient says talks about confusion dyspnea is like difficulty breathing okay you have hypotension 
you have low bp here you have tachycardia your your pulse is on the higher side you have tachapnea because of the difficulty in breathing the patient is trying to breathe more faster that's called tachapnea all these signs can push you towards a fat embolism and then at the fracture side you have to apply cold packs this is to decrease the bleeding and edema you then you notify the healthcare provider about any sign of fat embolism dyspnea chest pain decreased saturation so whenever you check you try to check saturation in a fat embolism i already told you you can have tachapnea and because of that improper breathing the oxygen levels can be falling also it talks about shock you can have decreased saturation so you have to always keep checking your pulse oxy okay what is diaphoresis that one second so these are the things you are supposed to notify so first thing is for fat embolism what are you all seeing you seeing whether the patient has difficulty breathing if the patient has excessive breathing or if the patient has any kind of chest pain if the patient has any kind of decreased saturation okay the o2 levels are falling on your pulse oxy and then last is diaphoresis so diaphoresis is the patient is sweating excessively if you are seeing all these kind of things you supposed to notify the healthcare provider and then if everything is fine you provide this patient with diet high in protein and vitamin c to help in quick healing proteins and vitamin c are very important for healing and then diet with high calcium content is usually not indicated in prolonged bedridden patients because decalcification is already there and it can cause further calcula and renal what does this sentence mean is that uh because of the fracture or if the patient is prolongedly bedridden there's more of resorption happening so the calcium levels in the serum can be on the higher side and we think okay there's a fracture we have to give the patient more calcium that is not how it is we have to check the serum calcium levels and if suppose uh, there is more amount of calcium being uh, you know uh, accumulated in the serum and you're trying to give more external calcium this can precipitate and from calcula it can form calcium stones in re, uh, kidney stones and we don't want that next you have to maintain hydration okay because of the amount of blood loss to prevent shock you have to increase the amount of hydration then you do isometric exercises to prevent disuse syndrome or to prevent atrophy of the muscles you don't want you want muscles to be in use so you're not allowing the limb to move you're keeping the joint stable but equally you're doing this isometric exercises that is like putting you know holding and uh, leaving it you're trying to give some kind of exercises to the muscle but uh, equally you're not you're not moving that limb that particular fractured limb okay that's called an isometric exercise where you're trying to trigger one group of muscle or a multiple group of muscles to prevent atrophy or disuse syndrome positioning frequently or every 2 hours now this is important for you to prevent if they are prolongedly bedridden you don't want pressure sore and that's a pretty bad thing for the patient also you don't want it so you're going to keep positioning you have to, you have to keep changing the position of the patient every 2 hours you teach about this three point which is a non bearing gait and you teach about the four point which is a weight bearing gait nurses whenever you're trying to ambulate the time what what do you mean by ambulation ambulation is you making the patient walk you're trying to put them back on their feet again you're supposed to stand on the affected side not on the unaffected side the nurse is supposed to stand on the affected side then what is swing to and swing through gait i already told you swing to is when you put both the crutches in the front and you're trying and you're pushing your limb near the crutch that is swing to swing through is you're pushing your limbs through the crutch So your limbs are landing a little ahead of the crutch. Okay. This is swing two. Here you can see it's more clearer here. These are the crutch. Okay. Here is your limb. You're putting your crutch first a little forward, and then you're trying to push your limb in between these two crutch. That's called swing two gait. You're not trying to put this limb. ahead of the crutch you're putting it nearer in between the two crutches that's swing two swing through is when those two feet land in front of the crutch that is 
imagine if the feet is landing here that is swing through okay you're swinging through is what is swing through gate this is swing two you're putting the limbs in between the two branches we have learned the steps while ascending now let's learn how do you descend with a crutch so firstly you shift the weight to unaffected leg okay you're shifting the weight to unaffected leg and then you advanced affected leg along with the crutch pehle when you what do you mean by you putting your best foot forward whenever you ascending you're putting your unaffected leg first but whenever you're descending you're shifting your weight to the unaffected side but you're putting the affected limb along with the crutch forward you're going down so remember that whenever you're trying to ascend you're supposed to put your best foot forward so you're putting your unaffected leg forward but whenever you're trying to descend the stairs you're putting the affected okay the affected leg forward along with the crutch then you shift the weight to the crutch and then you advance the unaffected leg down the stairs it's opposite to ascending the stairs and whenever you try there are pictures i'll show you how do a patient tries to sit on the chair so whenever the patient is trying to sit on the chair is what you do is firstly sitting in the chair with crutches is you position the posterior surface of the unaffected leg against the front of the chair so whichever side of the patient is unaffected that is what you're going to first start putting over the uh, chair not the affected side okay because you don't want to flex or you don't want to change the position of the affected side so you can flex and uh, you can extend the unaffected side but you want to keep the affected side in the extended position itself so you first trying to suppose uh, the left side of the patient is affected i'll show you the picture it's more easy there so here you can see that the patient's uh, right leg is affected right is affected okay right is affected and left is good so what is the patient trying to do the patient is trying to put her left arm on the chair first putting her unaffected side first okay she's trying to put her left side first and then she's trying to sit and trying to keep this affected side as extended as possible again here this patient's right side is affected the left side is normal so the patient is trying to first put try to put his weight on the unaffected side first and trying to reach the chair with his unaffected side was not the affected side again here okay what is gout uh, manu just we'll do 100 slides today that should be cool right is, is that good enough okay guys we'll finish 100 and we'll call call it a day today okay so we are at a 76 page another few to go we'll do 100 today what is gout gout is inflammatory arthritis it's because of uh, uric acid crystals so if you have hyper uh, serum high levels of uric acid in your serum that can precipitate and form form this crystals which cause inflammation of this joints especially it loves the great toe what is the great toe great toe is the first toe the first big toe of your uh, feet so that's where this gouty arthritis can occur what are the causes of a primary gout it uh, the first cause is increased uh serum uric acid why because there is reduced excretion of this uric acid by the kidneys the kidney is not able to push or uh, you know flush out all this uric excess uric acid and this uric acid is normally formed in purine metabolism you have two metabolism you have pyrimidine and purine metabolism and these are what which are being used to produce dna and rna so if you have an abnormal purine metabolism and there is an overproduction excessive of uric acid is being produced that can precipitate and if the kidney is not uh, flushing out this excess of uric acid it can remain in our system it can precipitate into uric acid crystals which goes and settles down in this joints leading to gouty arthritis okay second thing is starvation third thing is consumption of uh, seafood okay uh, seafood red meat and organ meats can cause increased uric acid in the body so you want to avoid this in patient who has gouty arthritis also more consumption of beer 
people think beer is good for health but beer can lead to gout or arthritis so if, if you have a patient of gout ask them to avoid beer and reasons for secondary gout is these are all primary causes so first cause is reduced excretion by the kidney second is abnormal purine metabolism which which is causing overproduction of the uric acid then you have starvation and then you have consumption of this uric acid high content food which is seafood red meat and organ meats and also you have more consumption of beer all these are all primary causes what is the secondary cause secondary cause is due to some kind of medications okay such as cyclosporins hmm? cyclosporins and thiazide diuretics uh, these can cause uh, uh, reduced excretion of the uric acid by the kidney which can cause precipitation of this uric acid crystals leading to gout and then you have other causes are Im just imagine any kind of metabolic disorders like first what metabolic the moment i talk about metabolic disorders what you can think about is diabetes you can think about is hypertension so put that in secondary causes if you have hypertension here you have diabetes here you have leukopenia leukopenia is uh, reduced wbcs polycythemia is more rbcs myeloma okay and you have trunkal obesity trunkal obesity is the patient is putting on weight on his tummy that's called trunkal obesity and you can, you see trunkal obesity in diabetes too you have central obesity in diabetes too even this tummy fat can cause gouty arthritis high cholesterol can also lead to gouty arthritis okay if you have a renal disease uh, if you have uh, improper kidney function because of a renal disease uric acid is not excreted out it can cause excessive serum uric acid leading to gout again what are the clinical manifestations uh, the patient will come to you with a painful swollen red joint okay you have signs of inflammation in that joint and it commonly affects the great toe midfoot and ankle these are the common areas where the gout is involved diagnosis is you'll do a serum uric acid level and this is elevated in gout and you also have elevated uh, wbc count because of the inflammation okay and if you do a needle aspiration of that synovial fluid uh, it shows intracellular crystals it shows this uh, uric acid crystals what is treatment so you you have to give anti inflammatory drugs which is nsaid and the best uh, nsaid if you get it in an exam giving you options choose indomethacin because indomethacin is what causes immediate relief of this gouty pain okay and then you have allopurinol it's a drug uh, it's a drug of choice for treatment of gout what allopurinol does is uh, in the purine metabolism it avoids excessive production of the uric acid it stops excessive production of the uric acid that's how it is the drug of choice for treating the gout and what yeah what are the other drugs you have other than allopurinol you also have sulfen pyrazone and your probinizid what probinizid does is uh, i'll just tell you how it acts it uh, in both uh, sulfen pyrazone and probinizid are uricosuric drugs uricosuric means it's in the name uricosuria it is trying to push the uric acid into the urea it's trying to flush out the excessive uric acid okay probinizid is uh, and sulfur and pyrazone are both trying to push away excessive uric acid into the urea allopurinol is preventing the production of uric acid and indomethacin is act, acting for the pain the inflammation which is happening at the arthritis relieving the patient from the pain and inflammation okay what are the dietary dietary restrictions you have to you have to avoid alcohol beer especially you have to limit intake of pure and rich foods we just discussed liver sardines all the red meat you are supposed to decrease also increase the intake of fluid so whenever uh, what do you mean by flushing out of toxins so you take more amount of water to flush away the excess toxins even here it's the same thing you increase the amount of fluid intake so that you have to you have a frequent urination and you flush out excess of uric acid corticosteroid may be used okay colchicine is used to stop acute attacks only if you have acute attacks you are supposed to use colchicine what are the key nursing interventions so whenever you have an arthritis you don't want to give a lot of movement to that joint first of all because of the pain the patient will not be able to give but you also instruct this so you tell the patient to have bed rest 
to relieve the pain by giving them medication okay you give them comfort to that particular limb you have dietary restrictions you are you are asking the patient to avoid all the above mentioned and you also do family teaching you also educate the family so this is uh, this is your great toe okay this is your phalanx and this is your first metatarsal head in between this this joint is being particularly involved here metatarso phalangeal joint is being involved here in uh, gouty arthritis this is a favorite place of the gout okay other than this you can see in between the see firstly here you can see this is one here it can happen and then it can happen in the ankle joint these are the three favorite places the moment he is talking about some kind of inflammation and showing you this area opt it as gout it is going to be gout only here you can see it in the hands which is very unusual but it's mostly occurring in the lower limbs and the favorite area of the gout is the first the great toe the first uh, toe of your feet here again you can see okay this is endomethacin tablets which is an nsaid which is being used to relieve the patient from inflammation and pain colchicin is only being used for acute attacks only okay we are back to again traction so what is the skin traction example i have already showed you there's a buck traction okay for lower extremity and you do stabilize the knee and then you have chin halter strap you know halter necks right halter necks i many of the girls i'm very sure many of the nurses might be knowing halter necks is something which is around your neck i'll show you the picture so chin and halter is being used for neck pain okay pelvic belt many of you know it's being used for the lower back pain then you have hamilton uh, russell traction which is used for femur bryan traction we already saw if there is a fracture of the shaft of femur the gallows traction is also called as bryan traction you're using it for a child okay and then dunlop traction is for the upper arm recommended for not more than 20 minutes okay traction is applied to the skin this is skin traction and wait for the traction on the extremity if you are using a traction on the limb suppose near the feet at its extremity you are applying 2 to 3.5 kg but if you are applying it to the pelvis you can go till 4.5 to 9 kg so remember that how much of weight you can apply if you are applying it to the extremity it is 2 to 3.5 if you are applying it to the pelvis it's 4.5 to 9 kg this is the buck traction uh you using it for knee injuries okay this is a skin traction you are applying the traction to the extremity here so you can go till 2 to 3.5 kg this is a chin halter strap for neck pain you have a you have a thing here for chin okay this is a halter and then you using it for the neck pain here very easy to identify this is a pelvic strap all of us know it's being used for a lower back pain Mm. I've already spoken about this uh, buck traction here. Okay, this is that uh, forearm traction, Dunlop traction, which we spoke about, which is used not more than twenty minutes. This is the Bryan traction. Bryan traction. Remember, gallows. You're trying to lift the bum above the uh, bed, and you're using it for uh, shaft. fracture of the femur in a infant or a small child okay so i'll just read this very okay, the very small for me to read i think this is just meant for pictures this is hamilton russell traction which are again using russell traction we have already learned about it which is being used again for the fracture of the femur but it's a trochanteric fracture okay so this is the bryan traction bum is elevated knees is slightly flexed okay and it's being applied for a child or an infant wherever whenever the child suffers with a fracture shaft or femur what is tendinitis whenever you say itis okay whenever you say itis itis means inflammation so inflammation of the tendons which is nothing but tendinitis it's also called as tendonitis meaning inflammation of a tendon it affects the tendon and the tendon muscle attachments achilles tendon many of you know it is present uh, behind your uh, ankle joint okay 
um, and then you have uh, what are the most commonly affected parts first is achilles tendon second you have the hip tendons then you have the elbow tendons all the knee tendons the shoulder remember all the major joints in the body all the tendons are most commonly affected in tendonitis what are the causes if you're using the limb too much that is hypermobility in calcific tendonitis if you are uh, having an abnormal body development if there is a postural misalignment if there is a trauma all these can lead into tendonitis so firstly there is hypermobility in calcific tendonitis there is abnormal body development there is a postural issue malalignment is there and trauma this all can lead into tendonitis here this is a bursa this is what you can see hypermobility leading to overuse has led to tendonitis there is a friction issue here which has caused irritation in the tendon what is bursa bursa is a painful bursitis is painful inflammation of the bursa it commonly affects subdeltoid this is your deltoid area so you have subdeltoid you have olecranon okay trochanteric is down again at the femoral head and then you have subacromium bursa olecranon is how you can remember is this is your olecranon process right whenever you put your hands uh, whenever you're trying to rest your elbows on a table on a flat rough surface like a, like a hard surface for a long time it leads to olecranon bursitis it is also called as student's elbow because how do students read they keep and like they keep you keep your hands like this and you read right you're putting more pressure here on your olecranon bursa leading to olecranon bursitis which is also called as student's elbow types are you can have acute you can have chronic you can have septic septic is because of an infection you can have calcific then signs and symptoms are same it's an itis it's an inflammation you have pain or on the palpation of the affected area you have all signs of inflammation you have bomb there because of that pain there is restriction of the movement treatment is you rest and you give a symptomatic relief for the pain you're giving a painkiller you're giving nsa and if there is any kind of septic bursitis because of an infection you're trying to treat the infection by giving antibiotics so this is an olecranon bursitis as you can see oh sorry this area you can see all this redness here it's also called a student's elbow it's because of uh, keeping the elbow excessively on a hard surface for a very longer time here you have inflammation of the acromion leading to bursitis of the shoulder and whenever the subacromial bursitis occurs they complain that they they're not able to lift their arm or they having pain while trying to lift their arm okay So you have a restricted movement of the shoulder here. Again, olecranon bursitis here. If both lower limbs are paralyzed and supported with braces, then hold the crutches in the hand of the patient stronger side. Okay. So suppose both the limbs are paralyzed and are supported by braces, then on which hand? Which hand you supposed to hold the crutches? You try to hold the crutches in the hand. of the patient stronger side among the both the uh, limbs whichever is the stronger side you try to hold on that side incidence of primary gout is more among men than in women here you know that the right side is affected more that's why the nurse is trying to stand or nurse or the medical practitioner is trying to stand on the affected side of the limb okay gout most classically affects the joint and the base of the big toe i've already showed you allopurinol is a drug of choice in to treat chronic gout or prevention of gout colchicin is only being used for acute attacks this is a gout here involving the the great toe if you get a picture of this sort always 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 think about gout first this is the colchicin tablets which is being used for acute attacks this is the purine metabolism so uh, what is happening is i'm not going to depth just remember that it's not the pyrimidine but it's the purine metabolism which is causing gouty arthritis so yahan pe this uh, hypoxanthin is being converted to uric acid here and here you have enzymes 
these enzymes are uh, helping in conversion of this hypoxanthin and xanthin into the uric acid this is being inhibited by allopurinol that's why allopurinol is uh, a choice a drug of choice especially in chronic gout because you're reducing the amount of production of plasma uric acid okay uricosuric drugs have already spoken about sulfin pyrazone and probenazine they cause excessive excretion of the uric acid into the urine these are the allopurinol tablets okay guys so i i hope you guys like the session today so we have seven viewers i hope you guys like the class i know that i can't be as excellent as sir i cannot compare myself to sir but i understand that we have to finish your portion too so i'm just trying to help sir in this uh thank you so much for cooperating with me so we had a two hour session today tomorrow we'll uh, start at 11 sharp okay uh 11 to 1 will be our classes and i i am actually going out to station for five days so i won't be there for five days let's see what we can do in the meanwhile thank you thank you so much uh, manu thank you guys have a good day to all the nurses around to all the brothers and sisters have a excellent day people who are working all the best for your working day uh dalia it's not possible to actually zoom the pic because it's all like in the presentation i can't do that but uh okay we'll try to include pictures which are like which is occupying the whole slide so that's more clearer for you guys what you can do is whenever i am keeping the slide open for you you can take a screenshot and then you save the picture and you can like zoom it in your phone directly at least it will stay with you yeah okay guys have a nice day take care i'm ending the broadcast